This is the only portrait that exists of Henry Court. Hard to believe when you think that his invention was one of three said at the start of the Industrial Revolution to have been more important to Britain than all 13 of her American colonies. But if we put aside what Henry Court might really have looked like, the truth is we know even less about how he came about his revolutionary invention. Until now. But first, let's look at all we did know till very recently. On the 7th of January 1783, Henry Court applied for a patent to cover his compound innovation of bundling scrap iron, bringing the bundles to welding heat in a common air furnace and then fining them through grooved rollers. The first part of Court's innovation was no innovation. It relied on something known as podling and while Wikipedia takes pains to mention that a man known as Peter Onion was the innovator of this first part of Court's invention, that isn't quite true. Podling as a technique for refining iron was used by the Chinese as early as 300 BC. It was known in China as chow, literally meaning stir-frying. By this process, cast iron is melted under intense heat in a blast furnace, then by stirring the molten mixture in open air until it has lost significant amounts of carbon, wrought or purified iron is produced in puddles and extracted in a way similar to what you can see in these 17th century Chinese panels. But it was what Court is said to have done with the iron after putting it through the puddling process that earned him his notoriety. According to the patent granted to him in 1784, after heating the metal to a molten state and stirring the liquid through an opening at the bottom of a furnace door, the surface crust of iron is shifted, exposing impurities that then gradually burn off with the heat. As the impurities burn off, the melting point of the iron rises, thus solidifying it and readying it to be scooped into lumps and drawn out of the furnace door. After this, the semi-molten lumps are fed through grooved rollers. The effect of this, according to Court's patent, was that, quote, the worst ordinary iron, being passed through the simple operation, becomes instantly of a good quality. Pieces of impure iron heated in the same manner and passed through the rollers together become at once welded into one solid body and ameliorated into good tough iron, close quote. Court's claim to innovation was the specific combination of bonding scrap metal and crude pig iron, heating it in an air furnace and then passing it through grooved rollers to produce purer and far more useful bar iron. In this way, Court claimed that, quote, pig and soul metal is perfectly refined. Pretty straightforward rags to riches story. Except there were no riches. A Court's invention didn't make him the vast amounts of money he was hoping for. Not to worry, because there never were any rags to begin with either. Far from it, Court came from a family of slave trade speculators and plantation owners. He was by no means a pauper. However, the oddities of the Court story don't end there. Whilst he claimed his innovation was the product of, quote, great study, labor and expense in trying a variety of experiments and making many discoveries, end quote, historians have been left puzzled for centuries as no account has ever been found of what Court's alleged study, labor or experiments involved. This would be like there being no evidence for Thomas Edison's invention of the light bulb except say for one document in the patent archives claiming that a man named Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. As it is, we have letters, detailed diagrams, photographs, minutes of the numerous lab experiments he carried out, and several hundred different patents evidencing Edison's progressive pioneering of the light bulb. As a matter of fact, Edison and other seminal inventors like himself were seasoned technicians, serial inventors, whereas Henry Court had barely any experience in iron production. In reality, he was a banker by trade, a sort of high-level accounts man. In fact, he was so good at this day job that he had banked for several high-powered admirals in the British Navy and even royalty, specifically King George III's brother, Prince Edward. At the time of his supposed invention, Court had only been tangentially involved in the iron business for about three years. In 1775, a debtor of his forfeited on a large debt and Court foreclosed on him taking over his ironworks in Portsmouth, only to find the works to be a major financial black hole. It wasn't till 1780 that Court, deciding to make a proper go of the failing ironworks, 
took out a Titanic loan using his connections in government through a Navy pay agent named Adam Jellicoe. That loan was needed to finance the construction of a water-powered rolling mill, infrastructure crucial to fulfilling a new contract to make mast hoops for the Navy. Thinking he would make massive profits and turn the Portsmouth works around, Court borrowed £10,000, over £2 million today. But as time went by, Court's lack of knowledge of the iron industry showed through as it became clear that the realities of this contract were not what he had hoped for. Far from making a quick profit, Court's Portsmouth foundry became a receptacle for all the Navy scrap metal. He was surrounded by, quote, extraordinarily large quantities of old iron hoops and, quote, not an opportunity of working them in any ordinary way without incurring a great loss. It's hard to imagine someone familiar with ironmongery making such a ruinous error. So then, how does a man who knows next to nothing about iron go in a matter of months from floundering financially in an unfamiliar industry to writing that he had, quote, found some great secret in the making of iron? This is no trivial question. It's been the embarrassing hole in the court story for many historians wishing to crown him as one of the great Anglo-Saxon fathers of the Industrial Revolution. But now they might just have their answer, except it's likely not the answer they were hoping for, because for this answer, we must sail all the way across the Atlantic to the unlikeliest of destinations, Jamaica. In the summer of 2023, Cambridge alumnus Dr. Jenny Bolstrode published a peer-reviewed paper titled Black Metallurgists and the Making of the Industrial Revolution. Two words, read it. Dr. Bolstrode's is an academic paper unlike any other. It reads like the Odyssey, and that Odyssey begins here, late 15th century Portugal, where gigantic ironworks were operated by blacks from North and West Africa. Some enslaved, some free Moors. All were engaged in ironworking. This is how Hieronymus Monza, the famous Renaissance geographer, described what he witnessed there. Quote, we saw a great workshop with many furnaces where they made anchors, gaskets, and every sort of marine equipment. There were so many black workers at their forge that you would think them cyclopses in Vulcan's cave. Finally, we saw the innumerable big and fine caskets in four large buildings, also missiles, shields, breastplates, mortars, small cannons, bows, lances, and everything well made and plentiful. Nuremberg's stores are nothing in comparison. How much lead, copper, saltpeter, and sulfur? Close quote. Whereas Monza was awed by the sheer size of black industry on which the Portuguese empire was being built, Bolstrode points out that this was just a fraction of the story of what blacks had been doing with iron for centuries. Split effectively into two parts, Bolstrode's work first takes you deep into Africa, to the Ghanaian kingdoms of the Asante and northern Igbo territory in modern-day Nigeria. Against this backdrop, Bolstro demonstrates how blacks had been working iron to their own ends for millennia prior. Indeed, some archaeologists have found evidence of steel making dating as far back as 300 BC in Tanzania and as far back in other parts of so-called Sub-Saharan Africa as 1000 BC. But Bolstro points out that what the European might have found strangest in the African's mode of iron working was his conception of it. Africans viewed iron in a dynamic, malleable, almost amorphous way. To them, it was an elemental substance, living even. The Yoruba god of war is an entity known as Ogun, but he is also a god synonymous with iron. Many of the deities' devotees were ironsmiths whose vocation was to create implements of war for the king's warriors. For the Yoruba, to worship the god of war was to worship the god of iron. But there's more. Africans made use of their iron in many different ways to Europeans. Iron was used as currency because of its strength and adaptability. Iron blades were tied often in bundles and exchanged as currency for bride prices and cattle purchases. These blades were useful in peacetime, beaten into holes and matchets for working the land. 
but in war the same implements used to cultivate life were turned to bloodletting. Impure iron or pig iron as the English called it was seen as profane to the African while wrought iron was pure, holy and often separated for use in rituals and sacrifices to the gods. To the African, iron was a living, breathing, manipulable substance. So that by the time the transatlantic slave trade had begun, white traders were often surprised by how much mastery of the metal Africans already had. Frustrated, some even wrote back to their suppliers in Sweden that the blacks of the Guinea were refusing their European-made iron currency due to their impurities. It was clear then that Africans knew good iron from bad iron. Why wouldn't they? They very often mined and refined their own. But the dark underbelly of this fact is that it was this same expertise that saw many blacks captured, sold and transferred across the Atlantic. Just as they did when they discovered the Africans' ingenuity with rice cultivation, Europeans started demanding slaves with expertise in iron smithing. See what we've exposed previously about the history of rice and blacks in America. Link below. Suffice to say that, plied with muskets and cannons, petty rivalries between the kingdoms of West and Central Africa were soon manipulated into epic wars, and the African market commenced to deliver what the foreign money masters most desired, black mines and black muscles. From what became known to white sailors as Slave Coast, a middle passage was carved across the Atlantic by slave ships bringing many of Africa's finest here, the islands of the West Indies. And it's here, specifically Jamaica, that Jenny Bostro traces the genesis of Henry Court's stolen legacy. This is the second segment of her paper, and it's the almost unbelievable part. Almost. The Americas of the late 18th century were very different to what you've been sold by Hollywood. Captured Africans brought to the West Indies were not self-pitying souls rocking back and forth on sugarcane stacks, hoping one day white saviors in an English parliament would free them. In 1791, Saint-Domingue would begin the most successful slave uprising anywhere in history. But over a century before this, parts of what would become Mexico had already been given up by the Spanish to black slaves turned generals who had fought and forced the King of Spain into drawing up treaties with them. Meanwhile in Jamaica say in 1780, if you were white and newly arrived on the island, you were sure to be warned of the Blue Mountains. Here Queen Nanny of the Maroons along with the legendary invisible hunter General Quau had forced the British to surrender to self-liberated blacks during something called the Maroon War. In the period leading up to Henry Court's alleged discovery, many of these men and women, along with their offspring, were engaged in business on the island of Jamaica, not as slaves, but as free men and women, hiring out the different expertise they had brought from their homelands in West Africa. In the late 1700s, some of these individuals worked at an iron foundry known as Reader's Pen. Make no mistake, Reader's Pen should never have existed. Decades before its establishment, a British law known as the Iron Act had banned, quote, the erection of any mill or other engine for slitting or rolling of iron or any plating forge to work with a hammer or any furnace for making steel in any of His Majesty's colonies in America, close quote. So how then could Reader's Pen exist? The intention behind the Iron Act wasn't really to bar rich whites from burgeoning industries like iron. Its raison d'etre was to mitigate against, quote, the threats that a plantation iron industry built on black skills and knowledge might outcompete Britain in manufactured wares and bar iron, close quote. In fact, an effective kickback was built into the law. One Dr. King documents that the law provided for a one-time penalty of £200 for the erection or continuance of these. Acknowledging the absurd stringency of the Iron Act as against white industry, colonial authorities in Jamaica later invited a moneyed merchant named John Reader to erect a large foundry on the island. Whether the £200 was paid and to whom, we don't know, but we know the foundry existed, and at the peak of its production, up to 76 black men were in its employ. 
some slaves and others free subcontracted workers. During the building of the foundry, John Reed is sent to England for 60 white workers skilled in the building and installation of state-of-the-art foundry technology. But after the foundry's establishment, a 19th century memorandum claims that Reader's black workers were, quote, sufficiently acquainted with the business of Reader to dismiss all the white men but two, and a perfect foundry was established where not only sugar utensils were made, but cannon manufactured, close quote. Simply put, Reader's pen had everything a foundry in Britain would have had. Bolstrode cites inventory documents detailing that the foundry included, quote, buildings respectively of 66 feet by 33 feet, 63 feet by 47 feet, and 66 feet by 38 feet with reinforced walls, 14 inches thick and the best hard timber, a large crane strongly bound with iron, four forges containing about 3,000 bricks each and two ditto containing about 20,000, a water wheel, at least two reverberatory furnaces and rolling mills, and by 1781, the scale of black metallurgists in running the multiple reverberatory furnaces of Reader's Pen was producing bar iron and turning a clear profit of £4,000 a year, equivalent to a relative annual income of £7.4 million in 2020 sterling. Jenny Bolstrode, 2023. Something else was present at Reader's Pen. These grooved rollers. We don't know who exactly, but one of the 76 at Reader's Pen had conceived of passing bundled and puddled iron through grooved rollers to further refine the iron. Jenny Bolstrode contends that it had to have been the black workers of Reader's Pen who came up with this ingenious idea. They were the only ones acquainted ad nauseum to using grooved rollers to refine sugar from sugar cane. Almost every black inhabitant of Jamaica knew sugar production and knew it inside out. And at Reader's Pen, it was also blacks who produced constantly the grooved rollers used on numerous sugar mills nearby. It was they who turned these grooved rollers towards the double use of producing bar iron. Bolstrode reminds us that these Africans were already used to tying their iron currencies in bundles such as these. It could only be at Reader's Pen where Africans not bound by European classificatory conventions and whose practices and purposes were their own, that the idea first came to pass iron bundles that resembled the bundles of sugarcane they knew all too well through grooved rollers at Reader's Pen. If you doubt Bolstrode's hypothesis, then you are forced to explain the incredible convergence of events that followed. For a total of two months, between the 3rd of March and the 3rd of May 1782, the British government imposed martial law on Jamaica, just enough time for the demolition of Reader's Pen to be complete. By who? By the order of Lieutenant Governor Archibald Campbell of Jamaica. His reason? Reader's Pen might be, quote, employed towards the reduction of the island by a powerful enemy. Close quote. But was that really the truth behind the governor's sudden act of state-sponsored vandalism? Bolstrode unveils records showing that more than six months prior, in November 1871, a ship named the Princess Royal, travelling from Jamaica, arrived in England. The Princess Royal arrives specifically here, Portsmouth, where Henry Court was struggling desperately to make something of his failing ironworks. But if that wasn't enough coincidence, records show that the Princess Royal was part of a convoy carrying John Court, Henry Court's merchant cousin, and Bolstrode believes it was this convoy that brought news of Reader's Pen to Henry Court. Indeed, Governor Campbell expressed doubt as to the seriousness of this purported threat in a missive to the king himself, saying, quote, I can scarcely conceive that such reasoning would have had any serious weight. Surprise, surprise, the Spanish threat never materialized. But what happens next is even more amazing if you're a collector of coincidences. Quote, Court's financial records for 1782 document that after the arrival of the Princess Royal in November 1781, Henry borrowed a total of £27,000 from Jellico. This was an outlay comparable to the great Jamaican works which John Reader valued at £30,000 in total and £22,000 without the first cost and occasional work. 
John Reeder's foundry was dismantled and loaded onto ships between the 3rd of March and the 3rd of May 1782. And it was not until 14th of December 1782, with the £27,000 laid out, that Court was able to declare to brother projector and steam engineer James Watt of Bolton and Watt that he had, quote, found out some grand secret in the making of iron. Almost overnight, a failing banker trying his hand at heavy industry, like a fish out of water, became one of the great inventors of the Industrial Revolution, while the 76 of Reader's pen disappeared from the pages of history. That is, until a university professor in the United Kingdom decided to do the hard miles and resuscitate their memory. But has the community of historical researchers examined her reconstruction of the implausible story of Henry Court on a good faith basis? Judge for yourself, days after the publication of Dr. Bolstrode's work, a furnace was readied. The fire came on several fronts. First, the straw man front. Many of Jenny Bolstrode's detractors have taken it upon themselves to put words into her mouth. This is the tact one Anton House took when only days after the publication of her paper he claimed that quote, there is no evidence presented that readers works were commercially successful because of a newly invented process, close quote. Dr. Bolstrode never once makes this claim in her article. A reader may insinuate it from her work, but she doesn't say what Mr. House valiantly rides in to debunk. Even more than this, the same individual along with others ignore the many holes in the accepted court story and instead point to the holes in Dr. Bolstrode's article by decrying the lack of any documentation which records verbatim that I, Henry Court, do solemnly swear that I stole puddling and rolling from Jamaican blacks on hearing of it from my cousin John Court. The cynicism behind such a demand is hard to take seriously. There are a great many deal of historical facts that have been gleaned not from a preponderance of documentation but from reading between the lines. And then there are places, events and people spoken of in their historical record that we doubt even existed today. Try the Library of Alexandria, the Colossus of Rhodes and many more. Then there are the verifiable things written down which historians refuse to even whisper about, like how Beatrix Potter plagiarized Peter Rabbit from the many folk tales of African American people and even confess to it in her letters to her publishers. Are the literary historians baying to expose this darling of English literature, even with incredible documentary evidence to prove what she did? Let's just say many of us haven't exactly been holding our breaths. What's more is the ridiculous notion that there would be smoking gun evidence of Henry Court's theft from an era during which white landowners sued patent offices on the basis that their slaves were property and couldn't possibly own the inventions they had come up with, and that thus the slave owner's name should be entered onto the patent rolls instead of the slaves. Spoiler alert, the courts sided with the slave owners. And this is the era from which Bolstro's detractors are demanding receipts. Does this surprise the trill and the black? No, it's only par for the course when it comes to black history. One rule for studying white history, another for piecing together black history. Not to worry, more like Jenny Bolstrode are rising. Special thanks to our producers Black Rampage 2, African Arts Legacy and Kayode Adewali. Scholars and sages, the trill and the black salute you. If you would like to join them, then see our membership page below. If you can't do that and still wish to show your appreciation then go ahead, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell for more great content incoming. This has been Trill Black, from Cush all the way to Compton, no doubt.